So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Hare, a professor from across the lake here at the University of Washington. Um, I'm very interested in building tools to help people explore and understand data more effectively. So let's just start with a couple examples. Um, so here, kind of an homage to Hans Rosling, who sadly passed away this last year. Here's a scatter plot of world health um, and economic statistics. So here along the x-axis of the scatter plot, we see fertility plotted. Along the y-axis is life expectancy. And then we see countries represented as individual dots. So this really represents you know, a snapshot of the world you know, around 1980. But of course, to understand data more effectively, we don't want to see just static imagery. We'd like to be able to interact with it, to understand trends, patterns, changes, and so on. So in this particular example, I might want to see something about the individual countries. So mousing over this, I see the label for Bangladesh, but I also see its trajectory. So basically, how has this uh, its country moved in terms of its health statistics over time? And I might do that for other countries as well, such here as you know, Egypt or Bolivia. But I don't want to maybe see just the static capture of these time traces. I want to see how everything moves together. So for example, using direct manipulation, I might grab this point and drag it through time. So in this way, I see as Bolivia moves along its timeline, I see how the other countries move in response. And in this case, you know, backwards or forwards, trace out decades of global development. In this case, just using a simple you know, tabular data set, there are a variety of visualizations we might consider. But of course, as we move into other more complex data types, there's you know, a, a richer array of visualizations we might use. This is a not very informative visualization um, showing you all the different direct flights across airports in the United States. And obviously, in this case, plotting all the data simultaneously doesn't lead to a lot of insight. So in addition to plotting tools, we need to have a knowledge as to what's going to make different visualizations more effective. So for example, in this case, I might instead use interactivity to show subsets of the data at a time. So in this case, as I mouse around, I can see the direct flights from individual airports uh, to each other. So in this case, you know, all direct flights from SeaTac um, to other airports across the US. And as I do this, you might notice that points are selected just as I mouse near them. So we have to worry about not just the quality of visual encodings, but the quality of interaction techniques as well. So for example, if I double click, I will show you the hidden visualization, in this case a Voronoi diagram, that's being used to accelerate um, mouse capture. So in this case, as soon as I move to a point that it's the closest to my mouse cursor, I automatically select it, thus helping me uh, more easily uh, select different data points within this data set. But I think the real value from interactivity comes really in understanding multi-dimensional patterns. So looking at further data about flights, this is over 500,000 uh, flights um, from the FAA showing their on-time performance. So this first histogram shows the arrival delay, so how early or late is the flight. The second histogram shows the local departure time, so what was the clock time in the local area when the flight left. And then finally, a histogram of distances. And it's useful to look at these just as univariate summaries initially to get an overview of the data. So one thing you might notice is that the mode of this first histogram is actually negative numbers, which is saying you know, basically a bulk of flights arrive early, uh, which may tell you more about the scheduling practices of the airlines than their actual you know, uh, flight times. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, having given, given this overview, we can then explore further to see deeper patterns. So for example, I might take the selection region using a technique called brushing and linking to cross filter these views. So I move this window around, I automatically not just have a selection, I re-aggregate all the data in the other plots to see how dependent different variables are on the selected view. So for example, I might say, well, why, what makes flights late? So as I drag out to the right, you know, starting from here, I can see how this distribution shifts. And that as I have later and later flights, they're much more likely to leave later in the day. Now, if you fly a lot like I do, this is probably unsurprising, is that delays can change. So delays early in the day will then propagate, causing flights to be later and later as the day goes on. And we can see that reflected here in this data. We might also ask, well, what allows flights to arrive early? And as we shift to the far left and see the earlier and earlier flights, we'll see a change in the underlying distribution of the distance histogram. So for example, we see that longer and longer flights, unsurprisingly perhaps, are more likely to arrive early because they have more distance on which they might be able to make up that extra time and arrive early. In this way, you know, we can explore these things both to get an overview of the data and then to begin to ask questions that might you know, vary along different dimensions and interactively gain insights into multi-dimensional behavior, even though in this case we're only using simple one-dimensional plots. So this is one um, instance of what I mean by interactive data analysis. 
And so, to support these types of interactions, I've been working on visualization tools for a number of years now. So now, basically over 15 years of work. And that started with toolkits written in the Java programming language, such as Prefuse, then on through uh, Flash, and then now using web-based systems. So I had the honor of collaborating with my former Stanford student, Mike Bostock, for example, on the Protoviz and D3 frameworks. And we've since been focusing on the development of higher level languages, declarative languages for visualization, such as Vega. And so, one problem with all of these tools, if you've done much, you know, for example, in the JavaScript world, is that they might be very powerful, but they're also very verbose. So they might be great for building, you know, very, you know, bespoke visualizations that you might find on the front page of the New York Times, but fairly unhelpful if you want to rapidly build a visualization for exploratory analysis. So one important question we might ask is, you know, how do we author interactive graphics in a way that allows us to build not just static plots, but interactive exploration tools in the midst of analysis? And so one approach that we've been exploring to this is a JavaScript library in a higher level language called Vega Lite. So this is a grammar of interactive graphics. And so by grammar, what we mean is we have a closed system. That is, we have a formal declarative language for specifying things like visual encodings, but also interaction techniques that loop back together. And this is to support very concise and rapid specification of everything from you know, basic statistical graphics, such as histograms, line charts, et cetera, but also to build multi-view visualizations, like we saw in that earlier flight delay example, that not just taking individual charts and stringing them together separately, but rather having a combined specification that allows us to build multi-view graphics. Whether it's things like a scatter plot matrix, where we look at all pairwise projections of a data set um, as a set of scatter plots, uh, concatenated and layered views that might allow us to repeat variables to see how they differ, or faceted views where we subdivide the data and then create multiple plots for those different subsets. These are critical parts of creating effective exploratory graphics. And then we want to add to these interaction. So as a first class citizen of these visualizations, you'd be able to do not just selections and panning and zooming, though those are of course very important, but also specify transformations of the data interactively, whether it's re-indexing data such as in the stock chart, panning and zooming to also create you know, filtered views, and then also cross-filtering below as which we saw earlier. So this way we want to be able to support not just these static plots again, but really rapidly create interactive graphics. Um, and so, fortunately, we've had some support in doing this, so we're very honored to partner with Jake Vanderplas and Brian Granger in creating Altair, which is a Python library for using the Vega Lite language. And while I would love to give a keynote just on all the intricacies of Vega Lite and Altair, um, many of others have already done this. Um, so, for example, my students gave a talk at OpenVizConf, so if you want to know more about interactive specification using a declarative grammar, please see that talk. If you'd like to learn more about some of the motivation from Altair, you can say, just rewind one year to Brian Granger's talk um, here at um, PyData um, around Altair. Um, and so while these things are, are great and you're excited, I actually want to spend my keynote focusing on a slightly different question. Rather than getting into the nuts and bolts of how to build a visualization, let's pop the stack and ask our question, how might our tools help us become better analysts? So that is getting beyond the nuts and bolts of these tools and how they work, how do they function within the larger process of making sense of data? And so one question that unfortunately all too often goes unasked when we talk about visualization is not how you build that, but rather, should I even build that visualization in the first place? How do I gauge which visualization is effective or not? So a starting point for our tour today will be then to ask the question, well, what makes a visualization good? Let's start thinking about that and use that as a foundation from which to think about how we might start building more powerful data tools. Um, so to start to answer this question and give you a sense of some of the research in this space, let's just do a quick experiment. I'm going to show you two shapes. Your job is to just make a value judgment. How much larger is the big shape compared to the small shape? Don't cheat uh, by using your thumb or a pencil to measure. Just make a quick visual estimate and keep it to yourself and we'll take a quick poll. So first off, here's two circles. Make a quick estimate. How much larger is the big circle relative to that smaller circle? Or in other words, how much would you have to magnify the area of the small circle to arrive at the larger circle? So raise your hands if you think the big circle is four times larger. All right, and as you do this, look around the room. Okay, five times larger. Some more six. All right, seven. No, eight. No more. Nine. Ten. Eleven or higher. Okay, so what's wrong with your guys' eyes? <laughs> that was a very long tail distribution. We had everything from 4 to 11 plus with a, you know, so basically we were talking about a lot of entropy here, right? Um, so um, not a lot of uh, consensus. Now let's look at a different example. Here are two bars. Do the same exercise. How much larger is the big bar relative to the small bar? So go ahead and make your visual estimate and we'll take another poll. How many people think the large bar is four times bigger? 
No one. Okay, five times. Okay, I don't see me. No one. Six. Okay, seven. All right, eight. Nine. Whoa, big drop off. Uh, Ten. Eleven or higher. Anyone? You voted twice almost. <laughs> yeah. okay, so, so obviously already, you know, a much tighter distribution. You might have everyone clustered around six, seven, and eight, as opposed to being spread out between four and eleven and a half. So in case you're wondering, the answer is the same in both cases. It's seven. Um, so here's a you know, way. Obviously, you'd have to melt these circles down to accurately fill the circle. That's seven here, um, seven there. So why is it so much easier in one case versus the other? Well, there's actually non-linearities in human visual processing. So there's an entire research area of graphical perception dedicated to try to study these differences and what we actually visually decode from information graphics. So for example, here is the results of studies we ran um, using uh, experiments deployed on Mechanical Turk, uh, looking at um, um, estimation error for a variety of different graphics. So we have bar charts with basically different bars, either, either stacked or with distances between them um, in terms of position and length, also looking at angle, um, circular area, rectangular area, and you see this fall off. And these are showing 95% confidence intervals of the air. And so by looking at these results, we can actually gain guidelines for more effective visualization design. So in this case, if I want to support the task of quantitative comparison, so basically proportional judgments, you know, I will prefer position encodings to area encodings as we all just experienced. And so we can turn this into sort of rankings that can be useful for design. So for example, given that task of comparing proportions, I can consult these types of resources or even create algorithms that use this as a resource for making informed decisions about which charts might be better to show in a given situation. So for example, here's a, a type of map that you might see all too often. This is called a choropleth map. That means it uses color as the encoding of a state region, in this case using a geographic projection, to communicate some quantity. So in this case, it's data about um, political donations and how many were made in different states. So in this case, you can see Texas and California might have given more, which probably isn't surprising because they have a greater population. But other things might be quite difficult to see. So not only is color a less effective encoding channel, as we will you know, see from those rankings, um, we also have confounds with shape. You know, also sometimes confounds with projectors that make things even more difficult to see. Um, so things like you know, what happened in you know, Delaware or DC or Rhode Island might be much more difficult to see due to relative sizes. So for example, we might can consult these kinds of resources and say, well, instead of using color hue, what other visual channels might I like to consider? Well, X and Y are already taken if we want to keep you know, with a map. So maybe we'll instead you know, walk up and use something like area, such as the size of a symbol, to communicate the quantity instead. So in that case, we'd go from this color map to one using size symbols. So in this case, these dark uh, filled circles basically show the quantities that were shown in the prior display. So in this case, you can see, yes, California and Texas do have um, higher values, as we saw. But DC actually has a huge number of contributions that was invisible in the previous map. In addition, we actually get some more latitude for interaction. So I told you the filled circles show the data I showed in the previous map. In this case, those um, empty circles show totals. So those dark circles are actually just showing a subset. And we actually now see set subset relationships by having symbols within symbols. So not only did we gain some more perceptual clarity, we actually gained more degrees of freedom with respect to showing interactive selections and how they compare in different states. So what to visualize, again, is a you know, more important question overall than like what tool you use to show it. Um, just to round this point home, I want to share with you my favorite example of a perceptual redesign. This was done by Michelle Borkin and colleagues while she was a PhD student at Harvard. And they worked in collaboration with doctors at Massachusetts General Hospital to try and explore different visualizations of arterial stress. So in the bottom left here, you saw was actually the state-of-the-art display at the time they started their research. So this is an anatomically correct 3D model of an arterial tract, and then colored using a default rainbow color palette to show you um, your shear. This is something a doctor would look at to make diagnostic decisions, for example, whether to administer certain blood thinning drugs, or in an extreme case, as part of the evidence that would go into making an operation decision. And you can see in these other quadrants here, alternative visualizations. So in one case, moving from a 3D model to a 2D model, where in this case, you instead represent an artery by cutting it open and unrolling it, and then ditching anatomic exactness to instead show sort of topological connections between arterial tracts. The other design move here, of course, is changing the color scheme. So for example, going from a rainbow color palette to a more perceptually motivated diverging palette that diverges into red for the areas that are going to be most troublesome or most worrisome to a doctor. Now the real interesting examples here though is what they did when they evaluated it. So they actually put this in front of real doctors with real diagnostic tasks to see their accuracy with these different visual encodings. Um, and actually quite shockingly to me, here's the results, each of which were statistically significant. 
So you have with a state-of-the-art visualization at the time, roughly 40% diagnostic accuracy. Simply changing the color scheme moved 30% up. So you have my 71% accuracy in this bottom right. And then moving from a 3D display to a 2D display gave you an initial with a 20% boost, almost as an independent factor in improving people's ability to spot trouble areas and make appropriate diagnoses with these visualizations. So these different choices of visual encoding really do change what we see, how easy we see it, and how we make valid comparisons. And so knowing something about what makes a visualization effective you know, is really important because I think most of you would have, um, you know, little, you know, not have a hard time deciding which of these displays they would prefer that their doctor use. Right? So these are not just a matter of intellectual interest. They have real world consequences for what we do and don't see in data. So we can use this as a basis to start to figure out how our tools might make us slightly better analysts. So one might be by providing some smarts in terms of appropriate visual encodings. Well, now let's look at you know, a slightly broader question, like given that foundation, and say, well, how might we support more effective data exploration overall? So given a new data set that we're trying to get familiar with, we might have some hypotheses to begin with, but others that might be nascent or discovered you know, as we start to interact with the data. How do we really um, make that process more effective overall? Well, it's a hard question to answer, but one where I think tools can play a role. Um, so just as one example, here's a data set taken from a juvenile corrections department from the state of Maryland, actually from a couple decades ago. The most important thing to know is that this is about you know, juvenile criminal offenders who've been processed by the system. And the other most important thing to know is that the x-axis is age. All right. So as a father of two young children, I can tell you I am very concerned about the rise in violent infants. Um, so there's clearly you know, something, you know, maybe it's just the state of Maryland, maybe the West Coast is different, I don't know. Um, but as a son, as a wonderful 95-year-old uh, grandfather too, I'm also very worried about these marauding centenarians um, out here. Um, so as you may have guessed, what are these? These are actually you know, data quality issues. In these cases, when the age of some uh, juvenile was unknown, different administrators had different policies of dealing with the fact that the integrity constraints on the database did not allow them to enter unknown as an option. So either opted for zero, the minimum, or like the maximum value allowed by their interface. Now, and that explains a lot of this data. Unfortunately, I have no good explanation for you why a 35-year-old is in the middle of this. I don't know, maybe they were particularly baby-faced. I can't say for certain. Nevertheless, data quality issues are one thing that obviously undermine exploratory analysis and something our tools can do a lot to help us identify. But I think a more a deeper and pernicious problem is what you know, we might refer to as blinder vision. So after years of teaching visualization and data science classes, a recurring trend I see is I give people an exploratory analysis um, project, they pick an interesting data set, they have their candidate hypotheses ready to go, and then they deep dive right into the data, often jumping into multivariate views without ever assessing simple univariate summaries, without asking what if questions about what are the ways the data collection may have been an error, um, or they might even overlook latent factors that are actually more explanatory because they were so focused on their pet hypothesis. And so thinking about how to make you know, exploratory analysis appropriately broad or comprehensive is another interesting thing to consider. And so there are many uh, pitfalls in analysis. I'm sure you, uh, if we brainstormed in this room, we could come up with a very long list. So I shared just two, right? Overlooking data quality issues, fixating on specific relationships. And of course, we know from like, both the intelligence analysis and the psychology literature that we, as kind of limited human beings with you know, you know, constrained cognitive capacities, have many other types of biases that affect what we see and how we think about things. So maybe our tools can play a little bit of a role in nudging us you know, away towards some of these more unfortunate tendencies. And so that's actually one thing that we're starting to explore in projects such as Voyager, which is the idea like to support you know, rapid interactive analysis of you know, using visualization, but to do so in a way that also supports you being a bit more broad in your consideration and you know, helps you not overlook certain data quality issues. So let me just go ahead and jump into a demo of this tool. So here's the Voyager 2 UI. For those of you familiar with tools like Tableau, you might notice some similar elements. We have, in this case, a data set about cars. So this is automobiles over a number of years. Um, different data fields with different types. So we have string data, numerical data, et cetera, laid out here with our schema. And we have visual encoding channels. So if we wanted to, we can drag and drop a variable and make it the x-axis, the y-axis, a color encoding, et cetera. All of these, which under the hood, are actually being transformed into Vega Light visualizations. So this UI is actually just a way of specifying form statements in the underlying Vega Light language. But probably what drew your eye first is this gallery of visualizations on the right. In this part, all we've done is loaded the, loaded the data set. We actually haven't specified a visualization, but we've automatically populated a gallery of recommended views. So this includes you know, basically summary views for each variable within the data set so that we can get a quick overview of the shape and structure of the data. 
So this includes you know, histograms of all of our discrete measures and then onto our you know, quantitative measures. Um, so in this case, you know, we can see you know, some have normal distributions, others look perhaps more log normal in nature. And doing so, we hopefully can spot any you know, unexpected values or outliers that might underlie um, uh, subsequent analysis. So looking at this, you know, I also noticed that mileage or miles per gallon you know, is one of the, the, the properties in the data set. So if I'm interested in that, I might start to build up views on my own. So for example, I might grab miles per gallon, drag it to the X field. You know, here I get a horizontally oriented dot plot. I can you know, change the axis if I wanted to log scale it. I could also just transpose the view. Now I have it along the Y axis. And you'll notice that while I've specified a specific focus view, I'm still getting these recommendations. But in this case, they're based on the view I'm currently looking at. So it's actually taking the Vega light specification for this view and then automatically identifying ways to generalize that and then present related visualizations. So I might see summary views such as a histogram or the global average, which in this case is about 23.5 miles per gallon. And I also see what happens when I start adding fields, basically in a search frontier. What happens if I look one step forward in my analysis but do so in a comprehensive way so I don't overlook potential relationships of interest. So for example, here I see that displacement, horsepower, and weight all follow very similar curves. They look rather quadratic in nature, but the relationship between acceleration and miles per gallon is quite different. So if I want a car that's fast but also has good mileage that was built somewhere in this case between the 70s and 80s, it's an old data set, I can see that at the time the top cars for that, those criteria were Volkswagens. So here's a VW pickup, here's a you know, Dasher, and so on. And so I can see these outliers that may be of interest if I'm looking for a fast but fuel efficient car. As I scroll down, I can see other relationships automatically as well, right? I can see that as the number of cylinders increases, mileage tends to decrease. Um, I can see that, you know, as the you know, I can look at different origins, and it seems like the USA seems to be creating the least fuel-efficient cars. Um, which, you know, we should say, is that true, or is there latent factors? You know, that's something we'll come back to shortly. And then finally, I see, you know, this plotted by time. So I can see that mileage appears to be improving over the years included in this data set. So let's say I wanted to learn more about that. If I mouse over this icon in the upper right, I actually automatically fill in in the specification view of what would be necessary to build this chart myself. So you actually scaffold learning by you seeing examples, you can quickly see how to build it yourself uh, by looking at this preview. I go ahead and click this, I'll make this the new focus view, and then I get recommendations that are then conditioned on this being my focus chart. Here I see raw data, but perhaps I'm interested in looking at aggregates instead. So this is actually the average mileage plotted here. So maybe I'll switch to this view instead. And then I see some breakdown by some different categorical fields, so including the number of cylinders. And then getting back to something we just saw a, a few slides ago, um, different origins. And indeed, it looks like the USA is doing poorly in terms of mileage um, relative to the Europe up and, and Japanese markets um, across time. So let's look at that more closely as well. And as we go to this other view, we see we get alternative visualizations. So for example, here I have a line plot with layers, but if I had lots of series, maybe it makes more sense to break them off um, you know, in a faceted view. So you see I have alternative codings recommended here, such as seeing Europe, Japan, and USA individually. I can also uh, choose to filter the types of recommendations I get. So for example, showing me only things where we add new categorical fields to the display. And doing so, we see a plot here that has the cylinders broken up into facets and then includes origin as color. And we see that while indeed the USA does poorly overall, it's also the only region producing eight cylinder cars, which is sort of by their nature have uh, worse mileage. So a more fair comparison, if we're interested in comparing these different markets, would be to look at the four and six cylinder cars, where we might get a slightly more fair comparisons um, and not be subject to ignoring latent factors. So in this way, you know, we want to explore topics of interest, but also be exposed to the breadth of the data. And this is what the Voyager tool is trying to help accomplish. So going back to the slide deck, you know, um, we ran a study of this and we tried to see how people actually change their data exploration patterns using a tool like this uh, versus a, a UI modeled after a Tableau. And what we found was that compared to these existing tools, Voyager led to over four times more variable sets seen. So people are seeing a much broader swath of different multivariate combinations of their data. And they're interacting with over two times more of this. So it's not just a thing that these are being rendered on the screen and ignored. People are actually engaging with at least twice as many uh, different plots with unique data uh, variables uh, driving them. I'm um, looking at some of the qualitative feedback. People said something like, you know, the related uh, view suggestion accelerates exploration a lot. So people found this really sped up their ability to get a comprehensive overview of a data set. It also aided learning as people said, you know, I like that it shows me what fields to include in order to see a specific graph. Otherwise, I have to do a lot of trial and error and can't express what I wanted to see. 
But we also saw that maybe these things can, in certain instances, work maybe too well in the sense that, you know, one person said, these related views are so good, but it's also spoiling that I start thinking less. I'm not sure if that's really a good thing. So I think this is really interesting, like, you know, given the scale of data, both not just the number of records, but the number of variables, um, human cognitive biases, some amount of automation can be really helpful. But there's clearly a delicate balance that if we go whole hog and sort of like automating data analysis, we're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And we also run the risk of people becoming passive receptacles of what some pre-configured set of algorithms say, rather than driving the analysis themselves. So really having this right balance between the analyst and computation within these interactive sessions, I think is critical. Um, and we're looking forward to exploring this more. We're further refining the system. I'm also excited to share that we're working uh, with Brian Granger and others to try and bring this as an integrated component within uh, the nascent Jupiter lab environment um, as we bring both Altair and Voyager, um, containing these things that we've been developing largely in the JavaScript ecosystem, but hopefully making them valuable um, in the Python data science world as well. And so we're really excited uh, to be working on that, very thankful for the collaborations that we have there. But of course, all the examples I've shown so far have really focused on visualization. And that's not surprising given how passionate I am, but also how highly developed our visual senses are. It's really a high bandwidth communication channel. Nevertheless, visualization is, of course, just one component in the much larger process of data analysis, including how we acquire data, clean it up, integrate diverse data sets, build models, and then also getting into social functions, like how do we share our results, get feedback, disseminate things more broadly. Um, and, you know, it would be lovely and ideal if we just, you know, move from one step to another in sort of an uninterrupted flow. Um, but, of course, you know, that is a fantasy and the real world looks something much more like this. Um, as I'm sure you've all experienced, you know, for example, visualization is often the front line of defense against incomplete or bad data. So I might visualize something and realize I might have to acquire new data sets, engage in additional cleaning. There's all these feedback loops that make the heart of this interactive process, that even if we have automated machine learning algorithms, we're spending an immense amount of time you know, in human-driven feature engineering, model validation and looping, et cetera. So understanding the interactive nature of actual data science practice is critical to identifying some of the pitfalls and making our tools better. So to understand this a bit more broadly, uh, my students, collaborators, and I also conducted a number of interview studies. So here's one quote um, that we really like to share. This came from a, a study we did back in 2012, where uh, data scientists and industry said, I spend more than half of my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. And so I, I've shown this quote a lot, and every time I do, I get a lot of pushback. People are like, this quote is just not right. Um, did anyone guess why that might be? But, yeah, exactly. So this, this gentleman yelled out 80%. So everyone is like, half? This is the luckiest data scientist I ever met that they only spend half their time cleaning up the data. Um, and so, you know, it's like, you know, that maybe, you know, at the time when we first were unearthing this, we were surprised this wasn't, you know, a bigger issue in terms of tooling around data wrangling, preparation, integration, et cetera. So at the time, we felt it something like the elephant in the room of data science research. You know, since then, I think this topic has gotten a lot more attention, both to our efforts and many others, is basically, as practicing data science became more popular and more well known, you know, you just couldn't ignore the magnitude of these issues. So that nowadays we instead have things like da big data Borat opining. In data science, 80% of time spent prepared data, 20% of time spent complaint about need for prepared data. <laughs> right. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of interaction happening with data even prior to building models or creating, you know, informative visualizations. Um, and so. You know, that leads to other questions that we might try and, and ask in the realm of interactive analysis. Like, how might we support interactive data wrangling? And this is something I've been working on now, you know, for, for over a half decade. I'll show you sort of like kind of a cl now classic result uh, students and I worked on back in 2011. Um, but before I do, I want to show you, you know, like, this isn't just nasty data in the form of missing values or like horrendously designed log files that you then have to map back into a table, something I like to call should be structured data. It's in some weird text structure, but it really had no need to be in that weird uh, idiosyncratic format. Um, even sort of well-curated data often has these issues. So for example, here's the U.S. taxpayer dollars at work. This is data you could download from the Bureau of Justice showing housing crime statistics. And this is designed for human consumption, really in a spreadsheet environment, and nothing else. So it's well curated, but you can load it into Excel. But if you try and load this into Pandas or into our data frames or into a relational database, you know, it'll, it'll break upon import because it's just not formatted appropriately. And so to explore some of these issues, uh, we built you know, a set of interactive tools for doing uh, data preparation. And one of the early research systems we built was one called Data Wrangler, and so I'll share a quick demo of that now. 
So here's the Data Wrangler UI using the same data set we saw in the previous slide of housing crime data. It's broken up by different states and each sort of has its own sub matrix. We've loaded it into a tool and we see a somewhat familiar spreadsheet style UI. We see a couple operations have already been performed that we recognize some delimiters, so we split the data into rows and columns, in this case based on tabs. And I could go on and you know, you know, imagine I had a set of commands I could you know, evoke from a menu that might be one way to try and clean up this data. But we again wanted to support you know, interactive transformation. We initially played with a gesture language, but we found our gestures rapidly end up being ambiguous. Like the same movement that someone demonstrates might mean different things based on context. So this actually took us down more of an automated recommendation and machine learning approach. So now like I indicate what I'm interested in, such as in this case, I'm interested in row two. Well, what might I do with the fact that I selected that row? Well, one inference is to just delete that row, but I can also examine the contents. I see that row is empty. So the second suggestion here is to delete all empty rows. And doing that, you see I get a visualization which then highlights what the change to the table will be if I choose that particular recommendation. So it turns out visualizing the effect of a transform was a key part for having people make sense of this tool. So in this case, it does what I want. So I go ahead and hit enter. And now those rows have been removed and I can go on um, with cleaning up this data. Uh, my column headers are actually buried within the data, so I'd like to extract out that metadata. So I click that row and I get some different options, including the ability to promote it to a header row. So I can go ahead and do that. But of course that was repeated, so I want to get rid of these additional header rows, so I can do that. Here one suggestion is to delete these rows based on exact value matching. And that works in this case, so I go ahead. And now I'd arrive, which might be kind of the more complex operation in this chain, which is extracting the state names to make them part of the data. Currently they're kind of buried within this text label. So to indicate my interest in that, I'll just go ahead and select the text Alabama. And the system infers I'm trying to do an extraction procedure. And indeed I am, but you know, the initial um, inferences are fairly simple. It's in this case matching by position within the string or by exact content matching. And I can immediately see in the preview that this doesn't work. For example, Alaska is not selected, Arkansas is cut off. So rather than waste my time with the suggestions, I can go ahead and just start giving it more examples so that I can better um, you know, generalize its inference. And now I see that you know, this looks good on this column, and the top suggestion is to extract from the column year after the text in, which also looks very appropriate for this data set. So I can go ahead and hit enter, and underneath the hood, we've actually learned a regular expression pattern for performing this um, extraction. Now as I'm doing this, you may have noticed some other features of the display. For example, this little numerical icon indicates that I've inferred that this is largely numbers. And here in red, I can actually select all the things that fail to parse as numbers. So I'm starting to get some initial like, type safety and data quality feedback. Meanwhile, over here in gray is showing me the proportion of cells that have missing or empty values. And so if I wanted to get suggestions of what I can do at a column level, I can go ahead and just click the header and I get some suggestions which include interpolation or filling. So in this case, it's actually filling down you know, the empty cells uh, based on the observed values. So in this case, I can go ahead and do that. Now I've filled out these cells with the state name and I wanted to get rid of these rows I no longer need. For example, let's say reported crime in Alabama. And you know, I could just throw away things that don't parse as numbers, but that could be brittle. And many spreadsheets actually have, you know, a value plus an annotation, which might, you know, break type uh, inference, but might actually be something I want to keep. So to be a bit more specific, I'll say I want to get rid of the rows that have the text reported crime in. The system initially infers I'm doing an extraction based on a text selection, but I can also give it a hint that I'm interested in deletions, and that helps, you know, limit the number of different uh, transformations it might consider. And then here I get, you know, as my top suggestion, delete all the rows with the text uh, reported crime in at the beginning. This is indeed what I want. I have a nice query, so I can go ahead and execute it. And now I have a relational data table I could actually load into any kind of standard analysis tool, uh, sparing you the minor detail of just renaming that column. So at this point, I might go ahead and click export. And because this data set was relatively small, it fits in memory in this browser-based application, I can just um, automatically um, emit all of the data, in this case in CSV or TSV or JSON, pick your data format. But as I've done this, what we've actually learned is a script, right? So this history down here is actually just a rendering of underlying programming language statements that we learned through direct manipulation interaction. So I could use this to actually cross compile to different languages. So in this initial research prototype, we actually, for example, generated Python code that would then run within a quick and dirty Python runtime we implemented as a proof of concept. We've since taken this research along further and now do things like generate scripts that will run at scale, you know, doing Hadoop jobs on Spark, for example. So I can actually interactively demonstrate a transformation script, get feedback, and then turn that into a program that I can then execute to run, you know, at scale. So that was the idea, you know, behind things like the Data Wrangler project. You know, 
And so since then, we've commercialized this. We started a company called Trifacta, uh, which releases a free tool that you can download if you like called Wrangler uh, that supports a number of these similar operations. In this case, you're seeing a data table of uh, contributions to political campaigns in the 2016 election cycle. In addition to the table, you see histograms. We have like preview visualizations to aid with data quality assessment throughout the way. Um, as I demonstrated before, you know, interactions like selecting text will lead to visual previews of possible transformations. But in addition, we've been exploring ways of doing automated visualization. So for example, if I come here and instead say, hey, given these candidate names, give me a profile of this particular column of my data set. And so it'll tell me things, you know, like you know, statistical summaries of different properties of the data, of you know, type issues, of outliers, et cetera. And in this case, for string data, to understand what's an outlier, we actually look at the length of the strings, which is a simple but strangely effective heuristic for actually spotting um, you know, untoward values in your data set. So if I want to, I can actually interact directly with this visualization. So on this box plot below, I can actually select the bar corresponding to the outliers that are high and get transformations relative to those, including filtering them out or isolating them for further analysis. So for example, if I elect to keep only the outline string values representing candidate names, um, I then get this data table subset, um, which you know, getting away from sort of the political morass of today, we can look at what are some of the candidates you've never heard of who didn't make it. These are all people who actually have a legitimate financial transactions behind their name. That includes candidates that is basically the letter um, A with caps lock stuck, pressed repeatedly. That is, you know, what else do we have in here? Um, you know, Lindsay Lohan, Emperor Goku. I don't know who that is. Uh, Remo, the cutest dog ever. The mini schnauzer from the dog party. Um, who else? Oh, Alexander Soy Sauce and Tater's Master First Gourd from the nap party. So there's this whole like, strange world of fringe candidates that had you just been dealing with this data, you know, through symbolic tools, you probably wouldn't have known exist. This could have actually, you know, maybe, um, you know, biased your analysis in certain ways, um, in ways that you might, might prefer to remove this data. Or if you're, you know, maybe a journalist, maybe there's a whole interesting story to be told in investigating what's going on on these strange fringe candidates um, who are actually registered with the Federal Elections Commission. So in this way, you know, interaction can also make, and make us aware of some of the things that we might have overlooked. And so this balance between you know, human-driven exploration and automation, again, proves quite interesting. Um, so more generally, I want to say that contrast sort of a, a typical approach to data analysis. So it might involve things like you start with a data set, you start writing scripts for transformation and visualization. If it's very large, you might also have to then extract a sample of that data to work with. You then run your scripts on that data, and then you might visualize the output. So you might, you know, like whip up matplotlib and create plots based on the output of having already run this transformation script. And you might, you know, iterate, et cetera, until you finally arrive at, at a, a suitable um, set of analysis procedures. And what we're exploring across these projects, both the Voyager and in the Wrangler projects, is, is a way to actually meaningfully invert this process. Actually start with visual representations of the data, whether that's text tables, summary visualizations, et cetera, and enable interactions with those, and then use that as evidence to see the search process. So underneath the hood, in both cases, we actually have a language model, whether it's languages for representing visualization or languages for representing data transformations. And then we actually do search and ranking. So we use enumeration and machine learning procedures to try and identify what we think good responses are to what the user has indicated they're interested in. And then closing that loop through visual feedback, whether that's new visualizations or visual previews of what transformations would do. To then kind of create a, a technique that's hopefully faster for experts, but also much more accessible for people who know their data, but aren't necessarily programming wizards. And so that's those types of things we're trying to explore in supporting interactive analysis. And so to wrap up, I'd like to share just some, some parting thoughts as we begin to explore this sort of space of tools. And I know many of you are avid data scientists, and many of you are probably also data tool builders. Some of these things might be things that you consider as you figure out building tools that people beyond yourself will be using to conduct analysis. Um, and so what are some of the considerations that we've come across in this short talk today? Well, one is you know, a careful balance of automation and control. So you know, by using you know, you know, automatic recommendations or machine learning, we're going to be able to expedite and also make broader the process of analysis. But to do so, we want to maintain the control of the, analysis, the analyst you know, at the center of this process. For example, there's many pitfalls to automation, as I'm sure you're aware. That's like loss of agency, intuition, and domain expertise. We want people's understanding of the domain, which vastly typically outstrips just the data resources you have at hand, at helping guiding you know, where the analysis should go, what things are genuinely surprising versus what are just noise. All these things often require human judgment. And if we just black box too much of this and automate it, we also run the risk of putting poor mo models loose in the wild, which could have uh, devastating consequences for various organizations, from government to industry, and certainly in health as well.
But of course, you know, we as humans have limitations too. We have our cognitive biases, we have blinder vision, and we make mistakes. So what are the ways in which these tools can actually help offset those? By having a better understanding of human capabilities, whether it's what makes a visualization effective, or what are common errors that people um, encounter in their reasoning or exploration of data, and trying to think about the design of tools in ways that help counteract them um, is, I think, a, a critical concern. Um, and so to do that, you know, what we'd explored in these projects was enhancing interfaces with underlying models of capabilities. So what do I mean by models of capabilities? Well, in this case, it was twofold. Like, to really enable these applications, we had to look at the language level, again, visualization or data transformation languages, that gave us a base to formally reason about the steps a user might take. Then we think about within those types of steps, you know, how can we rank them or like recommend them effectively, whether it's using you know, visual perception guidelines that help us pick more effective visualizations, or knowing based on the, you know, the data types and relationships what transformations seem most needed um, at the time. And as we build these things, you know, these models that we build to help power these applications themselves are going to require curation. And so I think an interesting problem that we're all going to face going uh, forward is how our interfaces themselves are going to learn from us over time. And I think data science is a particularly rich petri dish to explore these issues that I think will have much larger resonance across many areas of software. So how are these interfaces going to learn and how are we going to help shape them in the most appropriate way that the models they learn really do help a larger swath of people get their job done effectively? And so along the way, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting meta challenges as well. So this can require the means to inspect, monitor, and audit the models that are underlying an you know, increasing number of the interactive sessions that we experience today. Um, and so I think the type of tools and, and expertise um, that are being explored um, you know, by a community are going to be critical to these issues going forward. And so be very happy to engage uh, you all in conversation afterwards on any of the topics uh, that may have resonated with you. And so with that, I'd like to wrap up. I also want to thank all of my collaborators and students over the years. Here's just a small sampling of them, along with uh, different uh, funding agencies. Um, I'd also like to thank um, you all in this room. My group, myself, my students have made immense progress building on a number of the open source tools that the Python community has developed. So thank you for, for all that you produce and all the examples you provide. Thanks. Thanks.